If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Today, I'd like to focus on this idea of living generously. Living generously. Giving of our time, our talents, and our treasure to God. Living generously. Don't you just love generous people? And don't you just love being a generous person? Oh, one of the most generous people in my life is my father. My daddy is one of the most generous persons you'll ever meet. I thank God the Lord has positioned him right there at the head of our family so that everybody in our family can learn what it looks like to be generous. Because when God blesses you, you can barely hold on to it long enough before God nudges on your heart to give it to somebody else. So don't hold on to the things of this world very tightly. Hold them lightly. God is, he's, he's surveying the earth, seeing who he can bless with the blessings of heaven. Those who are stewards of everything that he has. He's looking to see who, who, the, who, who lives with a closed fist and he's looking to see those who live with an open hand. Because how many of you know that giving opens the hand of God? Amen. Giving opens the artery of our hearts to give. Giving opens up the arteries to God's heart to give even more. Didn't Abraham, our father of faith, say that we were called to be a blessing to the nations? How many of you remember what we um, were able to accomplish by coming together and giving to those who were in need in Houston? Didn't it feel so good to be a part of that? Didn't it feel so good to raise $40,000 as a church, as a collective people, and everybody gave what they were able to give, and, and many gave sacrificially, and, and folks, when we played the music, folks were coming up here giving to God. People were coming to like moonwalking, feeling so good about giving to God. Boom. It feels so good to give. And you know what? It hurts when we hold back when we know we can give, doesn't it? Because we're worried. Oh, well, what if this happens? Oh, well, what if that happens? Well, what if Jesus lived like that? What if Jesus says, you know, I don't. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Jesus didn't live like that. And he surely didn't teach his church to live like that. If you're in your Bibles, the first Timothy chapter six, we're going to read a few verses real quick. We're going to see what Paul is instructing Timothy to do. This young pastor in the making. OK, first Timothy chapter six. Are you there? Are you there, church? Are you there? If you're not there, we're going to put it up on the board. For those of you that don't have your Bibles, um, if you don't have your Bibles, you can turn in your smartphones, the Bible Gateway, open up your Bible app. You're going to have to read from the King James Version in that one. All right. Um, and uh, that's just very nice, eloquent, flowery language. Um, but uh, some other versions of the Bible break it down for us a little bit. Sometimes it takes the fun out of interpreting and trying to understand what Scripture is all about. But um, but nonetheless, don't don't lose the message. And, and the, 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 the heart of God's word is that we understand what God's trying to do is by, by reading what God was doing in his church, by reading what God was doing in his people. And that uh, that allows us to to take a peek into it and see what God was saying. So in chapter six of First Timothy, we're going to see what Paul was was saying to Timothy, this young pastor. Timothy was um, the um, uh, one of the the protégés of Paul. Paul was like um, one of the uh, apostolic pastors. He had an apostolic gift. You know what that means, apostolic? It's not, it doesn't just mean Jesus only, all right? In the Bible, apostolic means that you have the gift of, of calling others and commissioning them and, and placing the spiritual God-ordained authority upon others' lives on behalf of Jesus. Does that make sense? So apostle means one who is sent or messenger, okay? Apo means away. And so an apostle means one who is sent, one who goes and then sends others. And that's who, that's who Paul was. 
And I believe that's what he was trying to convey to Timothy. And I believe that's what Timothy um, was trying to do in the church at Ephesus. And I believe that's what God is trying to do in us. First Timothy chapter six, verses 17 through 19. Check this out, church. You're going to love it. Check it out. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything. Watch this. Underline this right here, because I bet you never saw this for our enjoyment who gave us all the riches of the world for our own pleasure. Somebody say amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. Today's message is not to heap guilt upon anybody. We're not here to blast out your rightful ability to, to be rich or to be successful or to be prosperous. No, God needs rich Christians. God needs the church to be wealthy. God needs the church to use the resources, the gold, the silver, everything that belongs to God. He wants it to be in God's church for the purposes of, somebody say, the kingdom. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, They will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This year, we just uh, we're about to finish up football season. My two boys, my oldest, Elisha, they lost in the first round of playoff, but he had an amazing game yesterday. Judah and Saka's team, the great Dominguez Park Rams, won their 10th game of the season. They haven't lost any games. They did tie one game, though, and, um, but they're getting ready to, to, to round up a, a good season and, and, and take the championship all the way. Take the championship all the way. You should have seen Saka had a catch for like 50 yards and a touchdown, and he ran for another touchdown. Saka is Pastor Kevin's oldest boy, my, my, eldest, um, my cousin Bibi's um, eldest boy, and, so, um, and he's just a phenomenal athlete. And, and, and my son Judah, had, he had a flag because they're not playing tackle yet. The little ones, older ones playing tackle. But, but Judah got a flag. And as Judah's momentum carried him over after he got the flag, Judah's got so much style, he like slam dunked the flag. And then he proceeded to do a dance and a shimmy and, and, and having a whole great, I mean, I mean, the world is Judah's stage, all right, just so you all know. Those of you guys that were at the game, you saw that, man. That's my, that's my Judah. He's not my middle son. He's my second oldest, all right? He's my second oldest. You got that, parents? That, not the middle child. He's your, they're your second oldest. So anyway, um, the game finished. Everybody gathered around. And we have the most amazing coach, um, Jeremy Bryant. Their family's a part of this church. He's an officer with LAPD. Great football player in his day. Played at Carson High, Harbor College. Went off to University of Hawaii. Played football there. Yeah, he, he, he gave it a little taste of going to the NFL, but he had his mindset. I remember before he graduated, he said, no, I'm going into the force, Pastor. That's where I'm going. And he was saved under our ministry and Coach Dave's ministry and Coach Kevin's ministry, Pastor Kevin's ministry. We led him to Christ when he was a teenager. He's such a, he was such a responsible young man at yet an early age. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal person, um, un, an unbelievable man of God and husband and, and Christian. And he is so generous with his time. He is so generous with his talent. He is so generous with his treasure. He coaches our flag football team like he's an NFL coach. I am serious. Me, I'm a pastor. I got so many things going on. I got so many irons in the fire. When I coach, I give what I can. But I have so many other things going on that, man, I'm scrambling before the game to try to put, the, put my line, lineups together and my practice, my practice itinerary. JB, he's got an itinerary at like 4 in the morning. He's texting all the parents at like 5 a.m. Like, parents, good morning. We got practice today. I mean, he is so generous with the way he gives. He's he's understood what it means to utilize everything that God has blessed him with 
And he is such a blessed man. And he's got such a beautiful family, a blessed family. But the purpose of me sharing that is not to put Jeremy on a, on a pedestal. But it's to convey the effect that it has had on our whole team, including all of the families. Now, parents, raise your hand if you ever have been a part of some kind of youth parks and rec team. Um, you got a kid, a nephew, a, nep- a, a niece, maybe a grandson, a granddaughter. Maybe you played at one point in time. Raise your hand right now if you have participated in some way, amateur sports at, at any level. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. Raise your hand like 75 80 percent of us put your hands down well let me tell you the effect that that the way coach Bryant's living generously has played out in our team when parents do snacks moms normally say okay let me go to Albertsons let me go to Costco how many kids do we have on the team let me get some fruit snacks If you're a health nut, moms are like, no sweets, no candy. I'm bringing oranges, watermelon, banana, and water. We got some parents that do that and organize snacks that way. If you lift it up to me, I'm going to go to the candy store and buy up the whole candy store and give them all to the kids after the game. Boomy's giving me the evil eye, and I'm not even going to look over there. The way our team does snacks, man, we don't deal with fruit snacks. Nope. Sorry, parents. We had one parent show up with nachos, homemade chili beans. She had hot dogs that she had, they had grilled. The grandfather even took special pictures of each player on the team and gave each parent, each family, a massive package that would otherwise cost like $50 or $60. I'm not kidding. So then another family, yesterday, After our 11th game of the season, it was time for snacks. I saw the kids were like, what are we having for snacks? They said, over there, under the canopy, closest to the street, the Tuyoti family is providing snacks. We went over there. How come we have ribs? Why do we have burgers, hot dogs? Barbecue chicken, Samoan style. And you know me, God forgive me, Rev, call me Rev. Rev, Rev, come over here, Rev. They served me a plate that was like a mountain high. It was like heaps of, that was like $25, $30 plate right there. They just, come here, Rev, come here, Rev. We take care of you, Rev. I, I felt embarrassed. It was an embarrassment of riches. I mean, snack, snack duty on our team, I mean, it's been taken to another level. I feel sorry for all of you who heard this message now. You're going to be thinking in your mind, good Lord. We're going to go right back to fruit snacks and water and a granola bar, and we'll be good. Praise God. Stick with that. Stick with what you know. But I feel sorry for whatever parent has snack duty next week at our last game. I'll just leave it at that. I was, they were, how are we going to top that? But you know, the Samoan culture, man, they have a gift of, of, of hospitality, don't they? The Samoan culture, they have, it is ingrained in them to give you the best that, that they have. It's in their culture. It's in their DNA. They will sit you down if they know you or don't know you. You could be walking by and smell the goodness of God over there on the grill. And they'll be like, hey, Uso, come get some. And you'll just be like, oh, hi, my name's Josh. Hey, here you go, bro. Take a drumstick for the road. I mean, no guilt. So I'm feeling all guilty yesterday during snack time. We're already like 40, 30 minutes into snack time. I mean, the snack time wasn't just grab your paper bag and go. It was like sit down and enjoy a massive feast. So I'm feeling all guilty about it. I look in my pocket. I'm like, I got $20. You know, at least I could do is contribute, you know, at least for the big, huge plate they gave me. We're like, hey, it's two yo to here. 20 bucks. He goes, Red, don't even. Keep that. Keep that. I was like, 
all right, put it back in my pocket. Because you know when you're generous, you don't, when you're generous, when you have a heart that is prone to giving, you don't, you don't even think about the money. What about, what about folks that are tight, though? What about folks that are tight? They give, but they're looking over there like, man, that's like 15 bucks worth of my meat, man. Like. <laughs> but those who are prone to give, they see that the meat's almost gone, and they're already talking about, hey, hey, go to the store. Go buy some more meat. We got to get more meat. When, when you give, you've already considered the cost. You've already counted what it's going to take to give from your heart because of how grateful you are. You know, that, you know when sheep are taken care of and they're, they're watched over and they're led to green pastures and by still waters? Did you know that when it's time to give and the snow melts away and it's springtime and the wool kept them nice and warm during the winter, there's going to also be a time for them to give too, right? They give of their wool. Fed sheep, sheep that are taken care of, will always give when it's their time and opportunity to give. What if we as a people, what if we as a church, we're looking for those opportunities to just give generously and live generously and to give everything that we have in order to bless other people's lives and to be a part of what God is doing? Did you know you're rich? Do you even realize how rich you are? Have we ever stopped to think about how rich we are? Did you know that the United States of America is in the top 6% of all the world in, in terms of the riches of the world, in terms of the richest nations? The United States of America is in the top 6% of the world. That means that there is another 94% around the globe, around the world, that doesn't even have anything that compares to what you have right now in your possession, in your bank account, at your home, in your garage, in your storage, in your retirement, in your, in your, uh, 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 in your incentive package waiting for you to retire. You are so, we are so, I am so rich. But sometimes we're so caught up in looking at others trying to figure out how I can get on their level. Oh, how can I get on that level? And there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. There's nothing wrong with having possession and wealth. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that is the driving force of our, of our existence, if the only thing that we're trying to do is go after money, if the only thing we're trying to do is just go after this and go after that, then guess what? We are serving a different Lord. But since we serve God, and since we serve Jesus, and he is our Lord, and not material wealth, not possession, not any of these other things, he says, I'm going to bless you because I know you're going to bless others. Because I know you're going to use the wealth, the riches that I've blessed you with to bless the world, to bless those who are in need to meet the needs of not only the body of Christ, but also people around the world. That's why it's such a blessing for us as a church who have learned from our pastor to give to missions. You know, some of us that haven't even been able to enjoy our wealth yet or enjoy our riches or enjoy the money that, that we never had growing up, we're so, we're so fixed on holding on to that that we, st we haven't come back full circle and learned how to give yet. Oh, we haven't enjoyed it long enough to learn what it means to now be generous and start giving it away. My time, my talent, my treasure. Are you guys hearing what I'm talking about? We are so rich. Paul was talking to Timothy and he, he was saying, okay, Timothy. Now you need to understand something about Paul's relationship with Timothy. Number one. Those of you who were part of our Wednesday night Bible study over the summer, you remember this. Timothy didn't want to be in Ephesus. Timothy wanted to be back with Paul and all the rest of the guys. He wanted to be with all the young pastors that Paul was training up. And they were going on missionary journeys from place to place. And that was so much fun. Paul hanging out with all the guys. Paul training them up. 
pouring into them, loving them up, all these great stories and memories that they were building and creating while doing God's work. Oh, man, when we went to Houston last month, it was such a blessing, the 15 of us, to, to, to come together, to talk on the truck drive all the way to Houston. Did you know that we were on a mission from God when we went to Houston? I'm going to tell you how I know we were on a mission from God. Because me and Brother Albert were driving in a truck. He was taking me to the airport. We made a wrong turn. We got pulled over by the police. And Albert says, oh, man, I don't got my, my license with me. Then I go, okay, well, don't trip, bro. Let me look through my bag. Let me get mine. And, and then I found out and realized I didn't have my license either. I go, oh, we got a couple of Mexicans in Texas. They're about to deport us. The guy pulled us over. Both of us said, we don't have our license, sir. He says, well, where are you from? Said, We're from Los Angeles. We're on a mission from God. Well. What are you doing? We're here. We're helping a church rebuild. And we brought, we brought a whole truck container full of goodies and, and, and belongings and, and, and six weeks worth of our possessions that we brought here, the best that we had to offer and send to Houston. Do you guys know how many good things were in those boxes that we sent? I was like looking at those boxes like, hey, uh, Sister Ray, what size shoes are those? <laughs> Sister Ray was like, oh, Pastor Josh, get out of here. Get behind me, Satan. I was tempted. And the officer says, all right, well, hey, I was just pulling over to warn you. You can't make a turn right there in the wrong, from the wrong lane. He goes, um, and all right, you guys, hey, keep doing what you're doing, man. God bless you guys. We're like, bless you too, homie. We peaced out of there. That's how we knew we were on a mission from God. Paul and Timothy had the relationship that was embedded. The context of what we're reading here today was that Timothy wanted to leave Ephesus and go back to be with Paul and the young guys. But Paul saw that there was something. He, he saw the talent. He saw the, the responsibility, the maturity in Timothy. And he says, Timothy, I'm going to go and we're going we're gonna to go do some, some work. We're going to be traveling around helping build and strengthen all these other churches. And I'm going to be back. So you're going to be the interim pastor. You're going to be the person in charge around here for right now. Okay, but I'm going to be back. Don't worry. Well, guess what? Temporary turned into permanent. Paul writes to Timothy right here in this letter we see. He says, now, Timothy, I'm not going to come back the way I, in I initially intended to come back. And I need you to stay. And I need you to build up this church, this church called Church at Ephesus, the Ephesians. I need you to instruct them on some things. I'm going to give you the, the essentials, the building blocks of ministry to form and to develop a strong church. And here in chapter 6, as he closes this chapter, this letter, actually, the first book of Timothy is actually a letter that is closed. It was sent by Paul. It's connected to 2 Timothy, but it was not a part of this email that Paul was sending to Timothy. It was completely separate. He says, now, Timothy, you and I both know that Ephesus is much, it's, it's an urban area. It's a very wealthy city. People are well-to-do, much like Los Angeles. We're right here by the port. People come to Los Angeles to look for jobs. People come here to, to, to set up shop and raise families. So one of the essentials of establishing a church is to encourage them in their generosity. Teach them to be a generous church, Timothy. Teach them to use their wealth and their, their prosperity and their riches for good things, for good deeds, and to not get tired in being generous. And all of this is very consistent with Jesus' character, isn't it? Amen. Isn't this very consistent with, with what Jesus was imparting into his disciples? Wasn't this very consistent with the way Jesus was teaching to the masses and the multitudes when they would gather around Jesus? How about the man in the parable who says, well, you know, I'm considering tearing down my old, my old silos, my own barns, and building bigger barns because I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, my business is just going through the roof, and I need more space. 
I need more space. In Luke chapter 6, he says, I need more space to store up all the riches that I am gathering and that I'm earning here on earth. And he was actually laying up upon his bed, dreaming about the ways that he was going to spend his money. Dreaming about the ways that he was going to use everything that he had for himself. Jesus says, you fool, don't you know that tonight your life would be required of you? Jesus, when he came to this earth, he came with nothing but himself, his life, his birthday suit. And when Jesus left, he went the same way. He didn't take everything that he had gained here except those lives, except those disciples, except those whom God had given to him and entrusted into his care. Jesus took them all back in his heart to the father with him. He left all material possessions. Jesus was rich. Jesus was wealthy. I'm talking financially also. He and his disciples, they were well taken care of. There were so many wealthy people in the, in the ministry of Jesus, his followers, the multitudes, his disciples, many women who were wealthy, who were just given everything that they had to see to it that the kingdom of God was established and that Jesus and his crew had everything that they need. Jesus, when, when his disciples traveled, they didn't stay at Motel 6. Mm -mm. They stayed at five-star hotels. They stayed at, at the homes of, of wealthy people that took care of them. And they enjoyed everything that they had. And when they saw a need, they met the need. That was Jesus' life. That was the, the, the character and, and the consistency of who Jesus is, who he was, and who he is calling us to be. Some of us get so concerned and we live such reserved lives. We're so conservative because we're so worried and preoccupied with this world. We get so scared and worried about the stock market. We get scared and worried about natural disasters. When things happen, people start pulling all their monies out of stock. They start pulling their monies, protecting everything that they have and start being so preoccupied and concerned with our material wealth in this earth. As opposed to saying, where is the need? Instead of, oh, the stock market is going to drop because of those earthquakes. Okay, let me see where I can put that money invested in the kingdom. Let me see where I can send some money to Puerto Rico and help them rebuild and help churches rebuild and communities rebuild. Did you know that's what we did? Do you know that's what, how we use part of the funds that we raised? We sent money to Puerto Rico and Mexico to help rebuild churches. We've sent money all over this world. Do you remember the, the, the tsunami of Samoa when we raised a massive collection, $12,000, and sent it to Samoa? Do you remember when the tsunami hit Japan? We did the same thing. We raised up as much money as we could, and we sent it straight to Japan. Didn't even think, didn't flinch, didn't bat an eye. We just raised that offering, and we cut that check. Boom. It was, on the, it was in the mail. When a person gives their life to Jesus, God begins to transform the person's life. He begins to transform their value system. He begins to transform and challenge the principles that they once lived by. When you become a Christian, you should become the most lavish, the most generous, the most giving person around. We should become the most generous of all. Because we're able to remember who our God is. We remember what Jesus has done for us. And we live our lives full of gratitude minus the attitude. We live our lives that, that focus on a God who is lavish and who is generous and who is good and who is great and who is just abundantly overjoyed to keep blessing his people because he knows his people continue to bless and give from their hearts and from their, from their substance. Let's not sit and think about the, the bigger barns that we need to build for our own purposes. If you're going to build bigger barns, build them so that you can bless others. I love what Paul is telling Timothy. Command those. He didn't, he didn't suggest. He, com he says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain. It's here one day and it's gone the next. But to put their hope in God. How many of you want to put your hope in God? Amen. How many of you want to put your hope in eternal things? How many want to put your, your hope in, in heavenly things? How many want to store your riches in heaven? 
by the lives that you're able to touch with the wealth that God has blessed you with. You remember when your family didn't have anything and how blessed you are now? Owning your own home, having our own places. Our kids have their own rooms. Some have their own beds. Even those of us, like when I was growing up, sharing bedrooms, my parents were still the most generous people I ever knew. My family, some of the most generous people you ever meet. And that's a blessing. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to say anything about my family. I'm saying I've been able to learn from them. I've been able to learn from my parents or from my, my auntie, my mother-in-law, our whole family. It's such a blessing. When we give, we give cheerfully, amen? amen. Not reluctantly, not, not begrudgingly. Don't even give waiting and expecting, okay, God, what are you going to bless me with now? Because I, I need that, God, so I'm going to do this so you can give me that. Don't give that way. Give willfully. Give because you want to. Give from a joyful heart, a cheerful heart. And God will bless you in return. How about when Zacchaeus, when Zacchaeus got saved, he came from, down from that tree. And Jesus said, hey, Zacchaeus, let's have a party at your house tonight. He says, okay, let's do it. He gave his life to Jesus. And he said, everybody that I've wronged, everybody that I've, that I've taken wrongfully from and, and exacted even greater taxes than I should have, I'm giving four times back to each person. That's how rich he was. But when God changed his heart, he decided to be the most generous person in the whole town of Jericho. Because God did an amazing work. You know, what always trips me out, too, is, and this is not, this is not saying anything about anybody else, but we got to be careful when we say things like, and God bless those who can't give. Because I don't believe that. I believe everybody can give. I believe there is, everybody can give something. I believe everybody can give something of their time. Everybody can give something of their talent. Everybody can give something of their treasure. I believe people, people even if we don't think that we have a, an earthly treasure, we don't have any money to give. Oh, we do have some, something to give. We have money to give. We just don't want to give it. We're holding back. We're being reserved. We're not remembering who our God is. And I'm not saying we got to be like that prosperity gospel, the prosperity church that says, I know you gave $500 right now. Can you give another $500 and, and give another $500? And if you give this next $1,000, oh, God's going to grant your wishes and, your, and answer your prayers. And we're not saying that today. God doesn't want anybody overdrawing their bank account. God doesn't want anybody giving out of guilt. God doesn't want, to get, want, to, want anybody giving out of coercion. That's not the gospel. That's not of God. It's not. But God is calling the body of Christ to be as generous as God will allow you to be generous. He's a good God. One of my dear brothers, who spent quite a few years in prison, taught me a very important lesson. He says, you know, when, we were, when I was locked up, there wasn't a whole lot to go around, he said, but yet everybody still had something. He said, but I learned a principle when I was a youngster. He learned, you only have what you share. You actually only have that which you're willing to share and give. I thought, man, that is, that's amazing. That's an amazing thought to think about all the things that we actually think that we have. We, we actually think that we have it. We actually think that we own it. It's really not ours. It's really God's. He's waiting to see what we're going to do with it. We don't have anything unless we learn to share it. 